everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Hildreth. I'm the Senior Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Studies in the College of Science. And welcome to today's Science Exploration Series. Um, we started these lectures because we thought that, you know, you come here for a football game, what you really need is science. <laughs> and so and we're really happy to see a full house. Uh, but it, we're, we, we have these lectures every game. And we like to bring people in and give them some idea what's going on inside of the classrooms and the laboratories here at Herrick Notre Dame. And so it's an opportunity for us to showcase some of our finest research, some of our most impactful research, for those of you who have uh, welcomed the opportunity to, to share. So thanks for coming. Uh, so today, we have uh, a sort of historical and science retrospective of the nuclear science lab. Probably people, when they think of Notre Dame, they don't immediately think nuclear physics. But as you can see, this, is the, this was from a few years ago. It was the 80th anniversary of nuclear science at Notre Dame. So this is a long and storied tradition of scientific breakthroughs, new technology, and uh, instrumentation, and just fundamental discoveries. So um, Professor Bardeen is going to tell you uh, a little bit about this and some of the, the history and science. Let me give you a few words about Professor Bardian. I love the bio. So, was, so Professor Bardian studies explosive nucleosynthesis that occurs in cataclysmic stellar events, such as novae, supernovae, I added nucle neutron star mergers, and x-ray bursts. So I just like that. <laughs> Whenever you can get cataclysm into your bio, that's really awesome. So, uh, so what he does is he really studies kind of these crazy exotic nuclei that are very unstable, but are really important for understanding how the elements are made in these cataclysmic events in the universe. And uh, Dan is also the director of the Nuclear Science Lab. And so with that, I will hand this microphone to him and uh, allow him to get started. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Notre Dame and to the Nuclear Science Lab. And uh, as uh, Mike mentioned, that I am the director of the Nuclear Science Lab, so I'm excited to see, see you here and to show you around. Uh, but what a beautiful day for some football, isn't it? Oh my gosh, I was driving over. The trees are gorgeous. I just love, you know, this time of year. It's just so brilliant. Um, but anyway, as Mike mentioned, we have a, a, a long and distinguished history of doing nuclear physics here at Notre Dame. We did recently celebrate our 80th anniversary, uh, and uh, we were joined by a number of former students and colleagues, and it was great to see everyone again to talk about uh, the history of, of nuclear physics here uh, at Notre Dame. You may wonder what we're doing here in the picture. Uh, well, the photographer told us uh, that we should pretend to be touchdown Jesus. <laughs> so that's, that's what we're doing. <laughs> I'm already up here front. Up front uh, um, well, okay, so maybe the nuclear science lab is not as well known as touchdown Jesus, uh, but it certainly is old, older nuclear physics here at Notre Dame. has certainly been around longer than touchdown Jesus. Uh, so I just want to tell you today a little bit about the history of the lab and, and then uh, about some of the types of research that we do. And then we're going to, uh, afterwards, you'll have an opportunity uh, to go uh, around the lab, to see the lab, uh, to see the experiments, and, and talk to some of the people that are actually doing the research uh, in the lab. Okay, well, you're going to see several accelerators today, uh, and they're actually all sort of based upon this uh, high school science experiment. Uh, you probably uh, have used a, a Van de Graaff generator maybe in, in high school and, and you know it as, that has this uh, conducting sphere on top of it with the belt moving charge up to this what's called the terminal of the uh, Van de Graaff generator and it can actually get up to several thousand volts uh, at, during this process and if you put your hands on there and, and it's a dry uh, day and you have hair a little bit longer than maybe my hair, they will, you know, the electrons will make it stand up as the electrons try to get away from each other. And, uh, and, it, and it's all good fun. Uh, well, in the 1930s, uh, they had the idea, well, why don't we make a particle accelerator using this technique? We'll just make it larger and larger. 
And so in the 1930s, they started building larger and larger Van de Graaff generators uh, in order to accelerate particles. Uh, here you see you know, some of the very first uh, particle accelerators. And here at Notre Dame, uh, it was uh, interesting that we actually uh, had one of the first uh, roughly five particle accelerators in this country were built here, was built here at the University of Notre Dame in 1933. Uh, it was built in Cushing Hall. Cushing Hall was the only building at the time which had a room large enough to hold it. And uh, when you leave here today, if you go out the front door of, of Newland Science Hall and walk over towards the stadium, you'll go right past Cushing Hall of Engineering. The building's still there. It no longer has uh, an, a particle accelerator on the inside, uh, but uh, the building uh, still is there, and I invite you to, to, to uh, view it as you go by. It's an interesting architecture on the, on the outside. Uh, but um, the university, under the guidance of Father Steiner, uh, granted the Department of Physics approximately $900 to purchase a high-voltage generator, which became the first accelerator here at Notre Dame. Now, $900 was uh, a lot of money then, but it wasn't enough to actually purchase it. It was actually built by the graduate students and the professors here uh, at Notre Dame. And here you can see an article from the South Bend Tribune uh, in August 1935, uh, right when the accelerator was coming online. Uh, it actually uh, was a very, very large Van de Graaff uh, generator again, uh, but instead of getting up to several thousand volts, it actually got up to about one million volts. Uh, on the terminal and was able to accelerate electrons and they were able to do some of the very first uh, nuclear physics experiments. They were also studying the breakdown of materials under high voltage and so they were lots of sparks uh, and uh, actually kind of interesting. A few months ago, uh, some of us were rummaging through some filing cabinets uh, upstairs in the nuclear science lab and actually found the logbook uh, from the high voltage laboratory, it says July 1938 uh, on it. So, it's, uh, I don't quite know what the scribbling is on the inside. They didn't necessarily uh, have uh, word processors to, to write down their notes. Uh, but uh, I, will, I invite you to look at the logbook as you, as you leave today. It's kind of, kind of surprising we just found it in a filing cabinet upstairs. Well, the accelerator ran and they did nuclear physics experiments. Uh, but there was one major drawback in that you had to have a very low humidity day. They couldn't run uh, the accelerator during the summer. And so someone had the idea, well, why don't we take the terminal instead of being in open air, let's put it into a vacuum vessel and fill the vacuum vessel up with insulating gas. And that would allow us to get to much higher voltages. And so uh, in 1940, they started planning for this new particle accelerator. Again, it was funded uh, by the university. Uh, and here's actually a, an excerpt from a, a, the a Notre Dame Scholastic magazine from 1940 where a freshman was asking, why do we need to build a new generator? And the professor says, well, we need higher voltages. Uh, and he says, well, what would be gained by higher voltage? Uh, the professor says, the higher the voltage, the faster the electrons move, higher velocity electrons disintegrate many more atoms than low velocity electrons. And the freshman seems kind of skeptical. He says, well, it seems to me all this atom smashing is nothing else but smashing of the world. Uh, and the professor says, on the contrary, in a sense, it's not smashing at all. It's a recreation of the beauty of the method of the world. It's like coming down to the beginning clay of all things and discovering the infinite task of design in creation. And actually, that pretty well describes what we're trying to do today in the nuclear science lab. We're trying to, to get down to the heart of matter. What is matter made of? What are uh, in the atoms, the nuclei? What, how do they assemble themselves in the nuclei? And how do they interact? We're, uh, we're still trying to, to pursue this basic idea of getting down uh, to, the, to the beginning clay of all, um, of all materials. In fact, there's a famous saying by Carl Sagan that we're all made of stardust. And I'll tell you, I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Okay, well, this new accelerator was in uh, the building next door, La Fortune. Uh, if you've been in La Fortune, you know it's the student union. There's the huddle there, uh, the Taco Bell, the Starbucks, all the, all the good things. Uh, but in 1900, it was actually the science building on campus. And in fact, if you look above the doors on the north and the south side of the building, it still says science over the doors. I don't think many of the students actually notice this when they walk in. But in 1900, it was the science building on campus. And here's a picture from the 1908 yearbook where they had this shiny new botany lab. Uh, and in 1897, the football team was so excited, they actually uh, went to the new science building to have their yearbook picture made. Uh, here in 1897. Um, I'm guessing 
Football was a hazardous sport even in 1897. <laughs> so that was the science building. And here you see the accelerator that was built in the 1940s. Uh, here's the terminal and the charging chains are on the inside. You can't really see the charging chains, but the whole thing kind of went into this pressure vessel that would slide on and they could then get up to high pressures, which allowed them to get to even higher voltages. Uh, they got up to 4 million volts. It was, at the time, the world's largest accelerator. Uh, and uh, in the 1940s, it was very useful. You may be familiar with, in the 1940s, that it was a very important time for nuclear physics in this country. We were in a race with Germany to understand atoms and to produce an atomic bomb. Uh, the scientists working at the University of Chicago would come over by rail car uh, and come over to the, to the accelerator over in La Fortune they would tell, they told the Notre Dame professors, you know, start up the accelerator and then get out. <laughs> because they couldn't, they couldn't know what was going on. It was all classified. Uh, and our previous lab director, was German, who was German, uh, likes to joke that well, they were afraid that the Germans would get the logbooks. Well, he actually has the logbook in his office now. So in the end, the Germans did get the logbooks. <laughs> Uh, so that, uh, this accelerator ran for a number of years. It had a very important role. We know now what they were doing is they were studying materials that ultimately would go into the nuclear reactors in Hanford, Washington. They wanted to know how those materials uh, that uh, were going to be exposed to high radiation, how they would behave. Would they become brittle? Uh, ultimately, they designed the Hanford reactors to make plutonium, which ultimately got incorporated into the, into the atomic bombs that were dropped on Japan. Okay, well in 1955, the accelerator uh, came out of, of uh, La Fortune and they built onto the building. Um, you can see here the, the pressure vessel coming out and I'm pretty sure the only reason we have this picture is because of the very poor lifting technique they were using. <laughs> it was only supported, it looks like on one side and one guy is pulling on it with other guys just standing underneath it without hard hats. <laughs> As far as I know, there, nobody was actually hurt in this process, but uh, that was the end of, of uh, La Fortune being the science building. It became the stud student union at the time uh, and had much more important roles, I guess, today of hosting the Starbucks, for instance. <laughs> so this building, Newland Science Hall, was built in 1952. Here you can see it, it, the design. It was this modern uh, science, uh, science building, lots of windows, uh, but I guess somebody realized that it was going to be very drafty and hard to heat, so in the end, they only had about half as many windows when they actually built it. Uh, but this building's been around since the 1950s, uh, and we're scheduled for a major uh, renovation uh, in the next couple of years, so I'm excited about that. In 1968, uh, the, the largest accelerator that we now operate uh, was built. It, the price had gone up. It was up to $2 million. Uh, for the accelerator in 1968. So prices, uh, you know, the inflation, I guess, was even a thing in the, in the 60s. The price went from 900 to $2 million uh, over a few decades. Uh, but this accelerator is our largest accelerator. It still operates today. It routinely uh, it runs experiments. It will run seven days a week, 24 hours a day. It's not running today, so you don't have to worry about radiation or anything like that. Uh, but uh, you'll get to see uh, this accelerator today. In 2012, a second accelerator was brought uh, to the university, and there was no longer any room in the building for it, so they built actually a tower on top of Newland Science Hall. Uh, and this accelerator was meant for doing uh, astrophysics measurements, for understanding the nuclear reactions occurring in our sun and things like that. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. Uh, but we like to joke that he, now you see all the major monuments of Notre Dame, the Basilica, the Gold Dome, and the new uh, accelerator for <laughs> astrophysics here at the Nuclear Science Lab. Oh, and Father Jenkins blessed it as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it's been, I can't complain, it's been operating reliably for a number of years. <laughs> In 2016, we got a third accelerator, uh, which you'll be able to see. It, it's actually meant for doing nuclear applications measurements. Uh, we're funded by the National Science Foundation to do basic science, but there's a growing interest in using nuclear physics to study various applications, and I'll show you a few of those in just a minute. Um, but altogether, there are now three accelerators that operate, uh, cannot, can operate simultaneously, and you'll get to see those today. Uh, the large uh, accelerator gets up to 10 million volts, uh, the one on the ceiling for, on the roof for astrophysics gets up to a few million volts and then um, the uh, third accelerator 
uh, that's used for nuclear applications, you'll also be able to, to get to see today. But it, it's kind of a, a unique situation to have three um, accelerators that can operate simultaneously here at Notre Dame uh, and can serve three users uh, at the same time. In fact, we have a number of users uh, that come from, from out the, throughout the world. Uh, here's just roughly the last five years that we've had about 30 national and international user groups from about 20 countries uh, that have come here to Notre Dame uh, to operate, to do experiments on one of these uh, three accelerators. Okay, uh, so that's the facility, but let me talk a little bit about what nuclear physics is and why we care about it. And so to start with, I want to start with your average, you know, uh, child and imagine now where are the nuclei in this child? Well, if you magnify this child by a factor of a billion, uh, you can get down to the size of the molecules that make up his body. Uh, and uh, for instance, adrenaline, he's obviously, you know, feeling adrenaline at this point. Uh, so that's uh, a magnification of about a billion. Uh, you go about another factor of 10, you can start to image the atoms that make up the molecules. So here's a hydrogen atom. Uh, atoms are mostly electrons that surround the nucleus. Uh, but the nucleus itself is much smaller than the size of an atom. You have to actually magnify it by another factor of 100,000 roughly to start to see those protons and neutrons that make up the nucleus itself. So just to give you an idea of what the size of, of an atom uh, is, imagine that a nucleus is on the goal line at Notre Dame Stadium. It's about one millimeter, let's say, wide. Well, if that's the nucleus, the size of the atom extends all the way to the other goal line of Notre Dame Stadium. So the nucleus is about one meter in size, but the electrons extend out 100 yards away. And that's, that's roughly what the, the scale of a size of an atom is. And we're interested in those nuclei that make up the atom because those nuclei undergo nuclear reactions. And these nuclear reactions are uh, the transformation of one nucleus to another, the transformation of one element to another element. And so these um, thermonuclear reactions which occur in stars, which occur in supernova explosions, they actually determine the properties of these explosions. So things like nuclei, which are one-tenth of one trillionth of a centimeter roughly in size, determine the properties of stars which are one-tenth of a trillion centimeters in size. So the difference in size by a factor of roughly a trillion trillion um, uh, difference in size. But yet the nuclei that make up these astrophysical events determine the properties of them. And that's why uh, we're interested, and we mostly are here at the Nuclear Science Lab, are interested in the nuclear reactions occurring in stars and stellar explosions. This is called nuclear astrophysics because we're studying those nuclei that occur in these uh, astrophysical uh, scenarios. So we have things like our sun. The, sun. the nuclear reactions in our sun occur pretty slowly, which we're happy about uh, because that means the sun's going to live for billions of years. We don't want the sun to go away, so that means uh, the nuclear reactions, which are releasing energy in the sun, are occurring relatively slowly. Uh, but there's so many of them occurring that the total amount of energy that gets released um, is uh, enough to heat the Earth and, and the solar system. And we know nuclear reactions are going on in the sun because these nuclear reactions emit particles called neutrinos. Neutrinos are, have been characterized as ghost-like particles. They hardly interact. They have no mass. Uh, but we can see those neutrinos coming from the sun. So we know nuclear reactions are going on. Now, neutrinos are ubiquitous from the sun. In fact, right this moment, approximately 65 billion neutrinos are passing through every square centimeter of your body. But you don't feel them, right? Anyone feel it? No. <laughs> they just pass right through. Uh, but we know, we, we see them coming from the sun uh, and not necessarily from other directions. So we know that nuclear reactions are occurring in the sun and uh, these neutrinos that are passing through us every moment are coming from uh, the nuclear reactions in the sun. Now, not all stellar events are as peaceful as the sun, and this is my primary research interest. I'm primarily interested in astrophysical explosions, such as supernova explosions, which are massive stars that completely shred themselves during the explosion. They can be bright as a 10 to the 36th power 
watt light bulb. You know, the average light bulb 60 watts or something like that. Uh, the supernova explosions are much, much brighter. Uh, sometimes they are so bright they can be seen at distances of trillions of miles. And they can outshine their entire galaxy that hosts that star before it exploded. Uh, they leave behind exotic remnants such as neutron stars uh, and black holes. Uh, and they eject their ashes into space. Uh, and these ashes that get ejected into space are the chemical elements that make up whatever comes afterwards. For instance, the Earth, we believe, was made up of the remnants of a previous supernova explosion. The heavy elements that make up the Earth were made in stellar, in some astrophysical explosion. And so, therefore, supernovae are often called factories that cook up the elements. They start with lighter elements and they produce heavier elements before they blow those elements out into space, which get incorporated into later generations of, of solar systems. And we can see these elements. We have satellites that uh, circle the Earth that have uh, detectors to look at the elements that are coming out of supernova explosions. For instance, here is a, is a supernova explosion where we're just showing you the calcium that's coming out of that supernova explosion. And it's spread out over something like, a, let's see, this is a, a billion, a trillion, something like a trillion kilometers in space, the calcium that came out of this supernova explosion is spread out. This calcium then could later get incorporated into, say, a solar system, into a planet. Uh, for instance, the calcium in your bones, the iron in your blood, all came from a supernova explosion billions of years ago. So the next time someone asks you how old you are, you might want to think about the age of the <laughs> elements in your bones and your blood. I bet you would get a funny look, right? <laughs> okay, well, my primary interest is, is understanding why do these stars explode? Why do stars like our sun seem like they're going to live forever, but these other, these other astrophysical events like supernova explosions, why do these stars explode? And it turns out it's related to the extreme nuclear physics, the extreme nuclei, the exotic nuclei that are being created in these astrophysical explosions. These nuclei don't naturally exist anywhere on Earth, don't naturally exist anywhere except in the cores of these massive explosions, but yet we can recreate these very same nuclei in the nuclear science lab and study their properties. And so that's what I'm primarily, primarily interested in, is understanding, producing these exotic nuclei, understanding their properties, and understanding the rates at which they transform from one nucleus to another. Okay, uh, so that's sort of, you know, the basic science interest, but we also do applied nuclear physics here. We also serve uh, a consumer uh, uh, advo advocacy groups and things like that. One, um, one productive program that's going on in the nuclear science lab is to look for something called PFAS. Anyone heard of PFAS? Yeah, a few of you. It's perf I'm not an expert, but it's something like perfluorinated alkaline substances. They are in a lot of consumer products. They cause cancer. They're called forever chemicals because uh, they never break down. They never go away. Uh, so we don't want them to have a way to get in your body. But in 2017, uh, a study found that these PFAS, these perfluorinated uh, alkaline substances, are actually in popcorn bags. They're actually in fast food wrappers. Uh, and so uh, after this study was published in 2017, uh, luckily, thankfully, fast food companies stopped using PFAS in their, in their consumer uh, uh, wrapping papers. Well, it, that wasn't the end of it. Just last year, 2021, uh, we found here that actually half of all makeup products contain PFAS. And this is horrible, right? Because you're putting it on your eyes, your lips. It has all these ways to get into your body. Uh, this was shocking to find. And within two days, there were uh, Senate and House bills uh, banning PFAS from makeup products. So it's a very uh, impactful program here at uh, the Nuclear Science Lab. Okay, I'm not going to go through all the different types of research because I'm going to let the people uh, on the tours tell you about their research and, and about the various uh, pieces of equipment that they're working on. Uh, but I just want to leave you with, uh, I always get asked, well, what good, why are you, you know, studying nuclear physics? What good are you going to get out of it? Well, actually, a lot of the methods that we use turn out to be useful for other things. And one of the best examples is in nuclear medicine because nuclear physics, nuclear radiation, is very good for looking inside of things. And it's very good at looking inside your body to, die, to image what's going on. And so there's things 
uh, like radio pharmaceuticals, uh, things like PET scan, positron emission tomography. This was all developed uh, using nuclear physics techniques. Uh, things like gamma cameras, uh, or uh, maybe you've heard of uh, MRIs. Maybe you've had an MRI uh, probe of your body. Well, they used to be called NMR probes, nuclear magnetic resonance, because there's nuclear physics techniques. People didn't like the name nuclear and what they were doing. So they changed the name to MRIs uh, now. Uh, but it's still, a, you know, it's an offshoot. It's a, it's a nuclear physics technique to image what's going inside, uh, inside in your body. Uh, so there's lots of, of, uh, of applications of nuclear physics. And, and I uh, hope you enjoy your tour today. I'm just going to end here, and I'll take some questions. But by saying there's a long and distinguished history of nuclear physics at the University of Notre Dame, uh, we continue to serve our nation's need for training nuclear scientists. Uh, in fact, uh, just a couple of years ago, we calculated that about 10% of, of nuclear PhDs re, uh, came from the University of Notre Dame in 2020. Uh, and so there's always a need for uh, a, nation, a national need for nuclear scientists. Uh, we're performing forefront world re unique research in nuclear physics, but our focus is really on nuclear reactions and stars and stellar explosions. Uh, and I, I, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't show you all this without the hard work of the talented team of researchers, of graduate students, who you'll meet today on your tour. Um, so thank you, and go Irish. <laughs> And I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. Neutrino, no mass. Not no mass. No it, mass. It, it has almost no mass. It's uh, we haven't been able to measure the mass uh, directly yet. Scale. It's uh, it's uh, very small. It's it's ten to the minus some big number kilograms. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Do you know the survival rate of someone sticking their head inside a, a large hydron collider? Uh, I would say for a variety of reasons that uh, it would not be a pleasant experience. Uh, um, now, people do stick their head in there without beams <laughs> and without vacuum, but the, most of the uh, all of the accelerators have to be pumped down to one billionth of atmospheric pressure. Uh, so there's no air in, a, in, a, in an accelerator uh, when it's pumped down. So there's a variety of reasons why you would not survive that experience. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any feeling for a renewed sense of interest in nuclear power generation? I, in, I'm sorry, asking, do I have any? Do you sense any enthusiasm for nuclear power generation here that maybe wasn't around 20 years ago? I, I think there is a, a growing sense of enthusiasm for a variety of reasons. Uh, we need energy security in this country. We can't rely on, on oil. Uh, we also uh, need to reduce the carbon uh, uh, footprint of our energy uh, production. Uh, so yes, there is uh, interest. And there's certainly a growing interest in maybe smaller modular nuclear reactors. Um, and we've sort of priced ourselves out of building large nuclear reactors. At some point, uh, it was, it was, the decision was made that nuclear reactors had to be so safe that there was no chance of receiving any radiation dose from a nuclear reactor. And that's a ridiculous requirement because we receive radiation from from neutrinos, from the cosmic rays. We, our bodies are made to absorb a certain amount of radiation every day. And so uh, the insurance cost, insurance, such a requirement to have no exposure of radiation has really made it where nuclear reactors are too expensive to build. Uh, but maybe smaller nuclear reactors. There's also a growing interest in using uh, fusion instead of fission to produce uh, energy. And that would be uh, potentially cleaner. We haven't uh, quite figured out how to do it yet, but there's been um, there's been a tremendous amount of progress in fusion energy generation over the past decade. Yeah. To what extent are are those the, the impacts of a cosmic explosion? To what extent are those predictable, especially as the future space exploration and the impact they may have on astronauts or other humans in transport to other bodies? Uh, so, so they're, they're not terribly predictable, uh, but um, they are so rare that the, you have to look um, 
you know, millions of light years away to find uh, a supernova explosion. The closest supernova explosion was, uh, what, 87 or something like that, uh, supernova uh, 1987A, I believe. So that one was actually close enough to detect some of the neutrinos coming from it. Uh, but that was, you know, that was 30 something years ago. So there, so there, there, it's relative, it's very rare to have a supernova explosion anywhere close to us that we would have a chance to um, be able to send astronauts anywhere near it. Even as far as colonizing on Mars? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, the closest star is the sun and, and uh, it will go through a helium burning stage, but it will not uh, become a supernova. Yeah. You got any data yet from the Webb Telescope? Uh, so it's coming in fast. <laughs> we are uh, excited about the prospect of getting data. No, we haven't personally uh, received data, but we uh, believe that uh, over the next five years, there's going to be a, a tremendous amount of data that does come from the James Webb Telescope. So we're excited about it, but we're not quite there yet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on the perfluorinated compounds, um, they're being measured in parts per trillion. And at some point, the dose is, the, the poison is related to the dose. And you said, like radiation, we're designed to absorb a certain amount of it. Yeah. I've been involved drinking water out of mud puddles, and I don't recommend that. But, <laughs> I mean, parts per trillion at some point, is, it, is the data persuasive, or is it just a correlation without causation that People have some of this in our blood, but it's not causing anything. They are inert compounds, pretty much, I think. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, obviously, we've been ingesting them for decades now. It's hard to know. It's, you know, cancer is, is so common in the U.S. population. 30% of everyone is, gonna, uh, is going to um, uh, have cancer at some point, but it's, it's hard to know. It's hard to quantify what the increase in probability is just because it's such a common disease as it is, you know, as it is. So th I think that's still an open line of, of research. But, you know, 10 years ago, I don't think we had, it wasn't even on our radar that this might be a dangerous compound. So uh, it's something, it's an emerging, um, it's, a, it's an emerging uh, uh, issue. Uh, I think nonetheless, you still want to avoid direct pass of, of it into your body, like makeup products. But it, it, like I said, it's not clear to me exactly how dangerous it is. Yeah. Did I understand you that you're able to synthesize compounds in the lab from like hydrogen to copper or calcium or something? Uh, yeah, we're able to produce the, the very same nuclei that occur in astrophysical explosions. Um, we start with, we can, we can accelerate uh, anything, f almost anything from hydrogen to uranium. So we have a large toolkit of accelerated beams to work with. Uh, and by barding them on, on, on targets that we choose, um, yes, we can produce you know, nuclei uh, of, of all sorts of different elements, but um, these are very small quantities. It's not like we can produce gold and take it to the shop. And... Do, they have... <laughs> Do they have electron structures still, or is it just the nuclei and then they... Most of them still have electrons uh, on them, but they won't, be f they won't have their full allotment of electrons, but they'll have, depending on their speed, uh, they, they gain electrons very quickly when they stop, uh, but when they're in a beam themselves, they're, they're, they're not fully stripped of electrons. They have some of their electrons, typically. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So, I'm in school to learn some uh, data science and machine learning techniques, and I'm just wondering what the, the sort of thing is being from the machine learning and data mining and sort of the unsupervised learning techniques to analyze all your data. Well, that's certainly a growing field, and um, there are a number of our uh, uh, faculty members that are um, exploring those types of uh, those types of options. I haven't personally uh, used those tools yet, but um, I would say probably two or three of our faculty members have have explored using uh, machine learning to to help analyze their data and things like that. Yeah. Okay, well, if there are no further questions, I'm going to hang around up front for a while.